Generating traffic and sales can be a challenge for online merchants. But selling on the Walmart marketplace puts your products in front of millions of customers who shop on walmart.com. And right now, sellers who join Walmart Marketplace can save up to 50% on referral and fulfillment fees for the first 90 days. So get started today. Head over to marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. That's marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. Welcome to e-commerce conversations, a podcast by Practical E-commerce. What is going on, Internet? Eric Van Holtz back again with another e-commerce conversations. Hope all is going well on the other side of the internet. On the other side of uh, the internet for me is uh, the founder of Dispatch, Brian. Welcome. Hey, Eric. Thanks. Glad to be with you. Yeah, man. Super stoked for this because Brian and I, he is our first investment in Area 627. For those who don't know, Area 627 is, uh, I don't like to call it an investment firm because it's, it's more of like a partnership firm, I'm trying to find partnerships with six-figure businesses and help them scale up to seven-figure businesses. Brian is the guinea pig, <laughs> so, but he's also got an incredible business that I'm excited to share. Why don't you give our listeners a quick rundown of uh, what Dispatch does? Sure. Thanks, Eric. So Dispatch Custom Cycling Components, we've uh, been around since uh, early 2018. Basically, we allow customers to customize a very a small piece of the bicycle called a headset cap, as well as a couple other pieces on the bicycle with either in-house artwork that we've designed or which is very popular, which is text of the customer's choosing so they can write anything that's meaningful to them on the headset cap and we laser engrave it and get it right out to them in under 72 hours. Now, the thing that I feel most connected with you is like you and I are both, well, I don't want to totally speak for you, but like I'm an ideas guy and I get the feeling that you have no shortage of ideas or inspiration. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's the good thing and the bad thing about, you know, any sort of endurance or outdoor activity. As I like to say, I never come back without a problem solved or without a new idea. <laughs> so every time I'm out on a ride, there's probably something new, at least one or two things that are coming back into the idea tank, as I like to call them. I have a big giant scratch pad of ideas that I write down and then eventually uh, some of them make it to the top and turn into real products. You've got a pretty accomplished career, but you've not always been an entrepreneur, right? This is a fairly recent thing for you. It is. I would say I've always been an entrepreneur at heart. <laughs> um, it's just finding that vehicle to let it out. I spent almost all of my career basically in enterprise software and then a couple of uh, different enterprises that I started on my own that I either sold or just didn't see the, the, the long-term vision and you know, kind of wrap those up one way or the other, but definitely, as I think you and I've talked about before, I see agency, free agency, you know, individual agency, if you will, as basically our ultimate freedom here in America. And to me, entrepreneurship is an extension of that. And, and certainly dispatch is a, a combined extension by you know, not only the ethos of the brand, but also, you know, what I believe is entrepreneurship being a, a great opportunity to express your agency. You kind of talked a little bit about like the brand a little bit. I want you to like touch base, like what is that vision for dispatch and, and something that almost seems like it could be commoditized, how your brand is able to help differentiate your company from the alternatives on the marketplace. Yeah, I think, um, so, I mean, we go way back, right? With cycling in, in my life, I was riding bicycles and using it as a, my escape as a child, <laughs> age of 11, I guess, probably earlier than that. But I really saw a level of exclusivity in cycling that was not going to be very beneficial to, you know, to the rest of the industry. We have this vision of, a, you know, the 135 pound you know, Tour de France uh, pro rider profile that the industry promotes. And, and I just didn't see that as the reality. And in fact, when I talk to my customers and when I see, you know, what, what's going on with the, the average cyclist, you know, I would say that that's the exact opposite of who they are. And I think that there wasn't a brand really celebrating that and embracing that as a concept. So for Dispatch, I really leaned into as I like to say, uh, less posh and more punk and really just be able to allow for the concept of inclusivity to come out in the brand. Yeah. You know, I've had a bike. I've been a cyclist, well, off for a while now, but when I was on, it was always, uh, you know, the guys wearing the span and I know you got to wear spandex or whatever, bicycle shorts and the clip and shoes. And there's just always this kind of like elitism that I felt like biking culture had. And if like you weren't, 
kind of in it or if you didn't have the best gear or, or whatever it was you're kind of looked down upon and i feel like dispatch completely goes that opposite direction yeah absolutely i <laughs> i don't think you have to wear spandex necessarily but you know there's plenty of other options but i'll tell you a personal story i lined up um, after having not raced a bicycle for many years uh, probably a couple of decades actually at a cyclocross race I'll call it about 10, maybe 15 years ago. And cyclocross, everybody kind of gets to the line early and, you know, you kind of line up and wait for the start. And this is my first time in that kind of event. And uh, here I am in my kit, as they call it. And two guys behind me are talking, you know, to each other. And I didn't have the shaved legs. And I was, uh, I think at six foot two, I was 215. So not necessarily a big guy, but in the racing world, certainly big. And one of them said to the other, who's the woolly mammoth? And I just uh, kind of... You know, it's like, wow, this is, uh, this is, it's hard enough to go out there and, and put yourself out, you know, in that kind of sport as, as a, a new person and you know, you're not part of the clique and it's even harder to, you know, sit there in, in a, a lineup and hear that. But, you know, my hurt, maybe it stuck with me. I don't know if my feelings were hurt necessarily, but I definitely saw the wrong type of attitude in the cycling industry. And, you know, I think it doesn't serve the bicycle manufacturers or anybody else that does any sort of business in the cycling business any good because you see a certain profile, you think you're supposed to look this way, you're supposed to act this way, you're supposed to dress this way, you ride this way, et cetera. And you buy the bicycle, you spend your $5,000, $10,000, maybe more, and you know, get all kitted out. And you go out a couple of times and you, you realize that isn't you. And Consequently, what happens is that bicycle ends up on a wall and, you know, it rusts and it, you know, the tires flatten. And I just, I didn't see that as good for the industry. And I certainly don't see it good for, you know, the the actual individual that wants to ride the bicycle and, and, you know, maybe even needs to ride the bicycle, right? Maybe it's their transportation to work or their therapy, their mental therapy, the physical therapy. So for me uh, with dispatch, you know, it's it's really that opportunity to to tell that story, to, to give everybody an opportunity to be part of that community and to, you know, just have a safe place to be a cyclist. I want to talk a little bit about the ideation for the brand and, and where that came from. Two years end, you guys are doing things probably different than most e-commerce companies in that you're essentially manufacturing the products and send them out the door. Where did you first get the idea for the company and, you know, how have you been able to essentially bootstrap it to where it's at now? So the original idea back in 2015, I purchased a mountain bike frame manufacturer. And as part of that acquisition, I really wanted to take the branded assets that the company had and and to turn that into things that people could buy that weren't necessarily the bicycle, hats, glassware, you know, mugs, those kinds of things, but also headset caps came out of that. And so we started working on kind of a line of merchandise for headset caps. I worked with a local laser engraver and just had these in, in the catalog. And before you knew it, they were really taking off. And you know, that, that's great as a business, but it's not so good for you know selling $2,000 mountain bike frames, right? So really separated that business at that point in time and turned that into dispatch as it is today. And you know, as far as the ideas and you know what customers are allowed to do and, and create, that's all in-house manufacturing. So as soon as somebody you know creates their custom text headset cap, we're able to lay that out into a production template and you know run on a big giant jig of orders for the day and get those out into the mail usually in under 24 hours. Why do that in-house versus working with a third party? Um, speed to task, really being able to take something that somebody has you know, created in, in the moment, right? So that you know, they have two, two lines of text that they can create on their headset cap and be able to turn that around instantly, but do that at scale, right? So that the laser engraver isn't particularly concerned about what it's engraving, but to be able to do that at scale and, and to, to get it out into the mail system, you know, the same day is really important. I don't think you could do that if you outsource to another organization or another you know, manufacturer that was able to take on that production. Now you were doing sales. How the hell do you learn how to engrave shit? <laughs> <laughs> the day that the laser engraver arrived, I've had two now. We've scaled up about four times the size of our original laser engraver. But I, I've worked in IT all my life and I saw this printer cable basically that came out of the back of the, <laughs> the back of the laser engraver and connected into the laptop. And I said, oh, it's a printer. So, you know, file, print, sends the job and off it goes. And being uh, perhaps not that uncommon as a person, I, I didn't read the manuals. And so this nice piece of wood that was in the uh, the laser engraver, it engraved, but it also caught fire. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, so it was literally 
trial by fire. Fortunately, we had concrete floors able to pick it up out of the bed and throw it on the floor and stomp on it. But <laughs> it's just been a process of learning. It's, it's not an overly complicated concept if you understand printing in general and vector graphics. But yeah, it was definitely self-taught. Yeah. So you just send some PDFs over there and yep. I don't know anything about ripping. And I used to work in a printing company too. I should be a little bit smarter than I am. Yeah. As they say, uh, printers print, right? Yeah. Now, I think obviously, I think the business model is great selling something that's about the size of, you know, maybe a quarter with some packaging a little bit bigger is a great e-commerce business, especially the ability to do customization and have that unique selling uh, proposition to your customers. Where do you think that dispatch can go beyond the headset? I think in any business where there's the potential to be a commodity, the community that you develop. So the relationship that you develop with your customers and the the relationship that customers develop with your fellow customers or potential customers, as well as just the messaging, right? We don't sell headset caps here. I think we sell inclusivity and we sell the opportunity to take a bicycle that might otherwise be neglected because it's one of a million literally and turn it into one of one. And I think that we'll continue to investigate and you know roll out products where it makes sense that allow for that individualization and you know basically keeping it pretty simple, right? We don't want to go too far into things that are complex around customization, but we want to give the, the customer the opportunity to, to do things to maybe paint scheme or uh, to the cockpit or the handlebars or anything else that is you know, perhaps smaller, but customizable. But also to connect to that lifestyle brand, right? So that we have not just a single transaction around a headset cap, but also a connection to our organization, to the dispatch that allows a customer to you know, promote the brand, promote what it stands for, and feel like they are included in, in the movement that we're trying to make here. How have you been able to connect with the community and, and bring awareness of the brand through these past couple of years? Yeah. So first off, a lot of manual outreach with, uh, you know, emails and just one-off communications, be it phone calls, you know, certainly the e-commerce side, the platform Shopify facilitates the actual transactions, but the opportunity to use tools like email and phone and text message to really get in front of individual customers and to listen to them. I think I, you know, as I said at the beginning about the kind of prototypical 135 pound Tour de France racer, I have literally hundreds of emails back from customers that have shared incredibly intimate stories about how the bicycle has touched their life and how what we're doing here at Dispatch has given them an opportunity to further whatever that bicycle means to them. And I think that that's really good validation that what I believe the market wants is actually there. And I don't know about you, Eric, but I've never written back a single brand with you know, a reply to, you know, a thank you email that you get as part of your transaction to tell, you know, stories about divorce or, you know, DUI or deaths in the family or, you know, just how the bicycle has kept them mentally healthy. And I think that those types of conversations, you know, that anybody would even be willing to expose themselves and share that. And to do so is, it's just amazing. And, you know, it's definitely a win in the sale for, for the company. I think it's a reminder out there, like, you know me, I'm a big fan of of building a brand and and really having a purpose to why you're building a company. A lot of companies, I feel like uh, either the mission is just kind of like an afterthought they they put into it or, you know, just some kind of like corporate mumbo jumbo. It's not something they really care about. As a small business, for anyone listening who's trying to get off the ground, like that authenticity to your company, to your brand, and ultimately to your customer that you serve is going to be the thing that differentiates you from everybody else. And it does create an opportunity where you are bringing value to your customers' lives in a big way, like in a way that maybe you see it or or maybe you don't. So I think about like just that investment into the brand Or awareness of what your brand stands for and and always have that at the front of the mind is one of the most crucial things to have in a really competitive marketplace when you need to stand out and capture customers' attentions and, and like I said earlier, bring value. I mean, that's ultimately what your business should be about. Yeah, I, I think the concept of value is really important because there are a lot of buzzwords that I think come into a lot of companies that, you know, sure, they're they're good for sales bumps in the moment, but value in a way that it translates to your actual values as an organization to the customer is really critical. 
I think you can kind of change these over time and, you know, maybe it's product-based or service-based or something of that nature. And in the moment, this value is what you're bringing to the customer, but there really does have to be core value within the organization that you just don't deviate from unless there's a really critically good reason for why you would do that. You know, those values then I think become perhaps another <laughs> overused term, but, you know, authentic, right? And I think authenticity is one of those types of attributes of an organization or an individual that you just can't fake people through. You can fake some people out about it, but it, it definitely comes out and you don't have to say you're authentic in order for somebody to know you're authentic. And I think when you have those core values and when you stick to them and you act around them, that it just becomes obvious that this is a different organization. This is an organization that truly is based on these values. And you know, this is a place that I want to do business with. I think about our own you know, core values, so to speak. And, and I would say that those are within me ultimately, right? As you know, the individual that operates the business. And it wasn't until I started to get feedback from my customers that I realized what my values actually were, right? And so the customers shaped those values ultimately, or at least they didn't, if they didn't shape them, they made me aware of them. And that made me have the ability to document them and, and to make sure that you know, whatever we do from that point forward stays true to those core values. And inclusivity, in my opinion, is paramount to that. Yeah, I think it's, you know, at your position, you're still a solo entrepreneur, right? Right. Yep. You know, like when you look towards the future and the vision, uh, building the company out, you know, like how do you foresee that process of, you know, bringing on new team members and making sure that they align with those core values and they can then kind of impart that vision onto the customers or into their work that they're doing if it's back office? I guess that wasn't really a good question. <laughs> what I really wanted to ask is like, what's the next step for building that team out? Like, how do you see the focus of your, essentially your career as the company continues to grow? Yeah, I think good leaders are like parents, right? Good parents show and lead by example and create, hopefully, you know, children in their image by way of those examples. And I believe the same about employees. You know, I don't know that anybody else will ever care about inclusivity and dispatch's future as much as I will, but I do believe that you can show and, you know, basically curate a set of employees that have those shared values that observe them and understand that this is the way that we work with customers. This is the way this organization exists, and this is why this organization exists. And then after that, you know, I think it's coaching and, you know, giving the ability to, you know, perhaps make those mistakes, but also learn from them and, you know, bring them forward into the, the vision. As far as the company's future is concerned, you know, we have an infinite amount of scale available to us at this point. So I think we have a long way to go before we really have to start to concern ourselves too much about the additional employees or, you know, anything beyond contractors. But, you know, certainly as that comes about, you know, for things like fulfillment and customer service, that will definitely be part of the criteria to make sure that, you know, these are values that we all hold true. I think there's, you know, as you continue to grow, there's like two paths that I think a lot of entrepreneurs kind of have that way of going. One is kind of like the operational way you know, and working internally to make sure the business is running leanly and efficiently and smoothly. And then, you know, marketing or external, like what is that brand? And at some point there's going to be like that diversion. Are you drawn to one or the other, or how do you see that happening in the long run? So ideas and I think vision come hand in hand and somehow or another that ultimately seems to end up back in the, the marketing and you know, the vision of the company. Operation wise, you know, I, I think there's danger there, of course, of you know, operating solo because, you know, operations every day is, hey, the orders have come in and they need to be sent out the door. So operate, right? Go get those done. And it's, it's very important to be mindful of taking that time to step back and still maintain the vision or, or curate the vision or, you know, craft it if you haven't gotten anything on, on paper yet. But if you don't do that, it, certainly for me, at least, if I don't have time to, ideate and to just come up with more vision, I grow stagnant, you know, so I, I have to have that opportunity to say, you know, two or three times a week for some couple of hours, I'm just going to sit down in front of the computer, or I'm going to go out on a ride, or I'm going to, you know, do whatever it is that's not focused on running product and getting it into an envelope, but rather, you know, just sitting and, and, and thinking about what else is worth us doing here and how do we incorporate that into what we do today. Do you run your days pretty structured or are you more of, you know, whatever's coming up? Like, how do you make sure that you, you allocate that time? 
Yeah. Uh, the structure is uh, super rigorous from 5.30 AM till about six. <laughs> <laughs> but after that, yeah, I would say that the first, it's like like the football game, right? Where the, the first you know, 15 plays are scripted or something. So I, I would say the first part of the day is very regimented, you know, definitely, you know, get the orders. I use Integromat to pull all the orders out of Shopify. Those go into Google's spreadsheet. And then, you know, I run down the artwork, get the uh, the templates set up for the day, answer some emails, you know, do some uh, some updates on the site and check the previous day's uh, reports. And then, you know, it's, it's off to whatever else needs responding to, usually uh, either sales calls or, you know, things that are customer service related that need attention. So like, I don't know, you, you kind of mentioned it earlier. I'm going to hold you accountable. You want to have those two hours a week, like. Is that a recurring thing on your calendar or is it just, you know, like how often do you hit that? How often are you able to think about the future and the vision and get out of working in the business and start working on the business? Yeah, that's actually a really good way of putting it. Working in the business versus on the business. There's no time block on the calendar. And, you know, I I always think if I compare the ideation time with how much time do I actually ride a bicycle? You know, this is kind of this, this paradox, right? Of, you know, the cobbler's children have no shoes kind of thing, right? It's like, okay, I, I make parts for bicycles all day long. And, you know, it's very important to be deliberate about it to say, I need to step away from the business for some period of time and go out on a ride and come back better for that. And that's hard to do because there's always something else to do. You know, as I am fond of saying, the, the to-do list never gets shorter. And I think that, you know, being strong and, and saying, no, I, I know that this is for my own goods, for my you know, relationship with my wife, for my friendships, for my business relationships, you know, that I have to spend that time. And so I wouldn't say I blocked the calendar, but I am pretty defensive about making sure I get that time to go, uh, you know, spend some time with myself and go on those rides or, you know, spend a, a couple hours just in front of the laptop and doodling essentially. <laughs> yeah. I'm bouncing back and forth between marketing and, and operations and, you know, like, how much brain energy goes into building those operational flows for, you know, developing products, producing the products, you know, fulfilling the products, like is half your day going to operations and half going to marketing and a couple hours to the future? Or how do you see that breakdown as a, a solopreneur of your time? I would say it's closer to 60, 20, 20, right? 60% of the time dedicated to producing product, getting it out the door, you know, the operations that have to be done on a daily basis. And I, I will say as, as much as I get nervous from not spending some time, you know, by myself and, you know, going on a ride or something like that, I get really nervous when operations start to fall behind. <laughs> so then, then it starts to become, uh, you know, everything else gets compromised at that point, right? To catch up. So, you know, vacations and a couple of days away on the weekend or something like that, you know, come Monday, it's, you're, you're pretty amped up, ready to get going. But yeah, I would say 60, 20, 20 is probably a, a fair split if I were to try to ballpark an estimate on that. But, you know, that, 60% of the time spent on operations is relatively mundane, so to speak. It's not stuff that takes a lot of thought. So I'll usually pop in a podcast and you know, kind of just listen to something in the background during that time. But that 20% of time that you're spending on ideation and really trying to figure out what the next thing is, I think that takes a lot of mental focus. It is therapeutic, but you can't do that for 60% of the day, I don't think. At least I can't. It is taxing. I put in a lot of energy and a lot of heart into that period of time. And I don't think I could be on, you know, level 11 for whatever, eight hours a day. Yeah. Where can people learn more about what you're doing, how to support you, how to get some heads up caps? Yeah. You can find me at uh, dispatch, www.dispatch.bike, B-I-K-E. And you can also uh, email me at brian at dispatch.bike. And you're also a frequent Twitter. You're on the D2C Twitter community. I am. I'm in there. I probably observe more than I tweet, but you can also find me there at, at dog root, D-O-G-R-O-T. Dog root. Is that Dutch? Dutch. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Sweet, man. Well, this has been a fun one. I'm excited to share your story and really learn about what you're doing and how you're doing it and share it with the audience because I think there's so much potential. It's almost like a firecracker. You know, you just got to light the fuse and stuff's about to explode. So it's just finding where that fuse is and what is the right lighter or match to apply to it to get it to do that? So, yep. It's been a good couple of years so far and I'm looking forward to, I think, a, a ton more ahead of us. Sweet, man. Well, guys, this has been another e-commerce conversations. I hope you guys enjoyed it and were able to pick a nugget or two from it. I certainly did. Always enjoy my time with Brian. Cheers. 
keep on growing. <laughs>